While the world whizzes by, enjoy a moment of me time with Tim Horton's new $6 breakfast bundle. Savor a small hot or iced coffee. Then add your choice of a mouth-watering hot breakfast sandwich mm. and a crispy golden hash brown. Ooh. And your pick of a classic donut. Yeah. All for six bucks. All just for you. Make your mornings all about me time with our $6 breakfast bundle. Available at your neighborhood Tim Hortons. Price and participation vary. Terms apply. Hello, and thank you for listening to The History of World War II Podcast, Episode 449, Killing Their Way to Moscow. Last time, the Germans were forced to abandon the town of Yelnia, just southeast of the recently taken Smolensk. The area was to have been used to launch limited raids, enough to keep the Russians weak. So when Hitler allowed the advance on Moscow to continue, the Russians would have little left in their cupboard to defend themselves. But, as the last few weeks had shown, Stalin had more reserve units than Berlin could have possibly predicted, and apparently better organizational skills than expected. No matter, that chaff would be cut through. Moscow would be taken. This was evidenced by Hitler's Directive No. 35 on September 6th, which ended with After destroying the main mass of Timoshenko's group of forces in encirclement operations, Army Group Center will begin pursuing enemy forces along the Moscow axis. Or, as all this was known to the Germans, Operation Typhoon, which would see the destruction of the West, Reserve, and Bryansk fronts. In other words, all Russian units that the Germans knew about between themselves and Moscow would be destroyed. This, combined with the recently captured 65,000 Russian troops, 250 tanks, and 713 guns resulting from the Battle of Smolensk, Berlin could not see how Moscow could not be open to attack. Things had been touch and go for a while, and many German men had been lost, but this was all about to be over. With Directive 35 on paper, Von Bock ordered Guderian and his panzers to return to him once Kiev had fallen, which it soon would, and Army Group Center would also receive Colonel General Hopner's 4th Panzer Group. Von Bock was getting the band back together, and together they would crush everything, defending the Soviet capital. And yet, the Nazi leadership could not help but get in its own way. About 106 miles, or 170 kilometers beyond Smolensk, heading towards Moscow, is the city of Vyazma, so directly in between the two major cities, but a bit closer to Smolensk. This was to be the next target, but that was as much as the German high command could agree on. They all knew they would need another encirclement, but whereas von Bock wanted to cast a wider net to get it further beyond Viasma, the OKH wanted a shallower ring, one that closed just on the other side of the city, and seeing what all three army groups had been through to get this far, that was a prudent decision. Von Bock, however, was trying to get to Moscow before the onset of winter, so prudence be damned. Yet, that wasn't the only point of contention. After this latest encirclement formed, Chief of Staff of the Army High Command, or OKH, Halder, wanted to send the motorized unit not only to Moscow, but inside of it, to create as much terror as possible, forcing Stalin to give up. But Hitler, again, with Napoleon in mind, wanted no part of urban combat. This was also true as touching Kiev and Leningrad. No, they would all have to be shown that resistance was futile. This pointing out to the Russians that it was no good to resist was to be maximized by having Army Group North Commander von Lieb and his 16th Army push their way to Lake Ilmen, south by southeast of Leningrad, while Army Group South Commander von Rundstedt and his 6th Army approached Kharkov, about 200 miles or 321 kilometers past Kiev. With all this happening roughly at the same time, 
No Russian army would be able to assist another that was threatened. But this would not come off as planned, which was very un-German of the German high command. But all this planning and flanking movements boiled down to one thing. Army Group Center wasn't moving forward. Hell, it had been roughly a month since any real advancement had occurred, and they had had to abandon Yelnia. However, this did bring one advantage to the Germans. Taking this time to do some scouting, von Bock knew there were at least 80 Soviet rifle divisions between himself and Moscow, and he only missed it by three divisions. But this was not what gave von Bock pause. No, it was the state of his own forces. The very front-line units were not getting regular deliveries, and this was the same for the Panzers, and the machines suffered for this. Guderian was down to about 50% of his tanks being serviceable. Hoth had it better at roughly 75%, but fortunately, the soon-to-be-arriving Hopner had all his Panzers accounted for. But even these fewer machines needed gas, and as things stood, von Bock was told his panzers had enough gas for another 60 miles. But that was it. Moscow was further away than that. Still, what would comprise Operation Typhoon, the attack on Moscow, would be von Bock's 56 infantry divisions, 14 armor divisions, 8 motorized divisions, 14,000 indirect fire weapons and 1,000 tanks, and flying over all of this would be 1,390 aircraft, all kinds. Matching this somewhat lack of preparation for the coming battle, the Soviets had their own list of weaknesses. Though all those summertime counterattacks were probably cathartic for the Stavka and Stalin, the result was, besides the Germans still being there, that most Soviet rifle divisions were now down to just 3,000 men apiece, which put them at least 6,000 men down. And now that they were on the defensive, this did not bode well. Next, the defensive lines before Moscow, the actual anti-tank ditches with other defensive works, were still only about 50% done. The most important one being the Mozhysk line, named after the town there, about 50 miles or 80 kilometers west by southwest of Moscow. Next, another mistake the Stavka made was thinking that the enemy did not have it in them for another attack after the Kiev battle. And lastly, when von Bock started getting his armor back, Soviet intelligence missed this completely. So how could the Germans resume their drive on Moscow? Despite this belief, the Germans came on. Back on September 24th, von Braulich, Halder, Kesselring, and von Bock met to war game Typhoon, and they would stick with the tactics that had gotten them to where they were, namely flanking attacks to cut off assistance or retreat, and then a direct attack to pin down said enemy forces, which just happened to dovetail nicely with the mistaken Soviet view that the Germans would come right at Vyazma on the road to Moscow. Facing this latest attack, officially, there were three Soviet fronts. The West Front, commanded by Colonel General Konev. He was responsible for a line 210 miles long, and his was the most northern of the three fronts defending the capital. The center line was guarded by the Reserve Front, commanded by Bunyini, and his area of responsibility was 60 miles long, which left the southernmost line the Bryansk Front, commanded by Yeremenko. The good news is that many of these troops, who had been fighting since June 22nd, had been encircled more than once and had lived to tail the tail. At least they knew what to look out for this time. The bad news was that, due to massive losses, many of the men on the Southern Front were not regular troops, but militia. Yet they had seen fighting since Yelnia, hence early September, so had seen the enemy in action as well. As was his wont, Fast Hines, Guderian, as he was called, had asked and received permission to head out two days ahead of everyone else when the attack came. But he did have respectable reasons for this, besides his ego. 
As he and his were on the German right flank, thus further away from the capital than anyone else, it made sense to get into position ASAP to help create a breakthrough and or take advantage of one when one was created by the other forces. On the southern end of the German line, just south of Bryansk, Guderian's panzers moved out two days early on September 30th, and it seemed that his confidence in himself and his sub-commanders was justified as Guderian and company smashed into Operational Group Ermakov, a part of Yeremenko's Bryansk front, and they scattered the five Soviet divisions in front of them. Soon, there was a 13-mile-wide gap in the Soviet line, well, at least the first line. But as far as Berlin knew, there wasn't much behind this latest enemy line. Lord knows that von Bock was going in with everything he had. But Ermakov, not to be confused with Yeremenko, the front's commander, wasn't giving up that easily. He rallied his shock troops and pushed back. Problem was, and it had been this way since June 22nd, this limited counterattack was unfocused and not supported by air power. Thus, it came to little. Yet clearly, with the location of this latest fighting, Moscow could no longer trade space for time. Those days were over. Thus, what few rules existed on the Eastern Front were ignored, which was experienced by 3rd Panzer Division, led by General Walter Model. Not only did his men get to experience Kayusha rockets for the first time, they got to watch horrified as dogs approached their panzers and then went under them, which is when the explosives attached to the dogs went off. Between the rockets, the deadly dogs, and the almost undetectable wooden cast anti-tank mines, 3rd Panzer suffered losses not predicted. But this wasn't the only hiccup Guderian suffered while trying to make for Moscow. However, it is said in German, he was about to experience the squeaky wheel gets the grease. As he had headed out before anyone else of Army Group Center, and the weather prevented a sizable air umbrella over him, the Russians assumed his move was a distraction. But, given his reputation of ignoring orders and driving on anyways, the Stavka started to send more troops to that area, at the very least to deal with the 13-mile-wide gap. Guderian, for his part, kept moving, and the Stavka kept sending more troops his way. But the overall equation changed on October 2nd, when the rest of Army Group Center moved out. Not that Yeremenko was aware of this, as what few raids the Luftwaffe was able to carry out cut his lines of communication. On that day, the 4th and 9th Armies moved out, but what they ran into was trench-like defensive positions from the Great War, which required the Germans to get down in the trenches and fight with bayonets, sidearms, and grenades. By the time the sun went down, 260th Infantry Division had overrun 120 bunkers. This was dirty and dangerous, but necessary work which allowed the panzers to have a solid performance on that first day. The River Desna defenses were taken over, and 3rd Panzer Group, driving to a point in between Vyazma and Bryansk, managed to split the 19th and 30th Soviet armies. Even better, the 4th Panzer Group bloodied the 43rd Army of Bunyani, as it was a part of the first line of defense. But then the panzers kept going, and then mauled the 33rd Army that had been behind the 43rd Army. But then, the various ideas of how to attack, combined with way too much confidence, muted the assault. When Colonel General Eric Hopner's 4th Panzer Group managed to get about 50 miles or 80 kilometers behind Soviet lines, actually a bit past Vyazma to its southeast, General von Kluge of the 4th Army suddenly ordered him to turn north, away from his objective, and away from Moscow, to create that smaller encirclement that they were arguing about, just east of Vyazma. Von Kluge was focused on making sure no enemy troops escaped, but Hopner was focused on his goal. They were both right, 
but there were only so many panzers to hand. The question of the size and number of encirclements had been a major issue of contention between the various commanders, but von Kluge, of whom many did not like or respect, had decided for himself. And it must be said, a sizable amount of Soviet troops would be trapped just to the west of Viasma. Of course, the plan had been to cast a much wider net, but this move on von Kluge's part not only split the German armored forces, it was missing the point of the whole goal, to have more enemy troops dead while they, the Germans, ended up closer to Moscow. Von Kluge was not being a team player. But Soviet incompetence saw von Kluge's mistake and decided to match it. Hopner's turned north, as ordered, towards Yuknov, still southeast of Vyazma, but closer to that city, was noticed by Soviet air, which was reported to the marshal. But as he kept asking for confirmation, not wanting to get anything wrong and end up shot, by the time he was satisfied that it was true, Yuknov, the town, had fallen. And then, the reality of war affected both sides. When they first moved out, Hoth's 3rd Panzer Group was driving east, to a point just north of Vyazma. At first, though moving consistently, it could have been faster, had it not been for the regular air attacks by Soviet planes. But then, as he got his speed up, his fuel supplies went down. By October 4th, while taking on Major General I.S. Kovnev's Western Front forces, and doing rather well, Hoth's panzers literally ran out of fuel. Konev had been here before, and just as soon as word reached him of Hoth's stoppage, he asked Stalin for permission to retreat. But he knew the Russian warlord would be equal parts, no, stay and fight, as well as, yes, we need to salvage what forces we have as our backs are up against Moscow. So he, Konev, used that time of deliberation to counterattack. He ordered Bolden to hit the German northern flank coming at him, while having Roskazovsky's 16th Army attack from the south. The extra time this created saved his men, as that night the Stavka allowed the men to retreat, rather than be caught up in another encirclement, or Kessel. On an unrelated note, soon after this, Hoth was then ordered to go to Army Group South, and a Colonel General Hans George Reinhardt took command of 3rd Panzer Group. And showing even more courage, asking Stalin to retreat was the first instance, Konev then ordered the 16th and 19th Armies to fall back, but hopefully in a way that the Germans would not notice at first. This order would eventually end up being given to the rest of his Western Front a day later on October 7th. But then he, Konev, canceled out his own brilliance by ordering Roskazovsky to hold the asthma. But this made no sense, as the new commander Reinhardt's 7th Panzer Division and Hopner's 10th Panzer soon met up at Viasma. Thus, General Lukin, who had been trapped at Smolensk two months earlier, was now trapped at Viasma. And it was he who now had the job of leading his men out of the city and out of German hands. The Stavka told him to attempt this escape during the night of October 10th, through the 11th Panzer Division, as they were deemed the weakest of the enemy units around them. Not weak, just the weakest. But fate had something more grand in store for Major General Mikhail Lukin. He would be wounded in the next few days, severely so, and captured. And as he was a respected member of the Communist Party, the Germans would carefully nurse him back to health and make plans to use him as their leader of the anti-Stalinist Russian units. But after the war, Lukin would write he would have never taken such a position. Still, he would be tried by his own country for this. Well, for being captured and possible treason. But he would survive all of these trials and he would die. In 1970. Thus far, things were going well during the opening moves of Operation Typhoon. In the center, panzer groups had met up and Vyazma was captured. To the north at Kalinin, though it would take a few more days, 
that area too would belong to the Germans, which left the South and Fast Heinz Guderian. Guderian's forces, a part of the Second Army, were to drive forward and not only cover von Kluge's right flank, but for Guderian to trap Yeromenko's forces, which consisted of three armies, plus, as we have seen, Operational Group Ermakov. In other words, Guderian was supposed to have been the southern or right half of three encirclements. But, as had happened at Minsk and Smolesk, he was more interested in driving towards Moscow. His, or anyone else's flanks, be damned. Now, in defense of Guderian, he knew that his right flank was relatively secure after the victory at Kiev. And as far as his front and his left flank, well, he planned on destroying any of those forces. But again, as previously, Guderian was yelled out enough to eventually become once again a team player. Second Army started moving in earnest, but Fast Hines would send his 17th and 18th Panzer Divisions to the east of Bryansk. This not only fulfilled his obligation of closing off the Bryansk Front, but it also cut the city's rail line to Moscow on October 5th. Even better, the next day, October 6th, his panzers also captured the Bryansk Front headquarters. Yeremenko and his adjutant escaped, but some of their staff members did not. And on October 8th, Guderian's panzers met up with the other elements of 2nd Army, north of Bryansk. This second, though incomplete circle, or Kessel, had now been closed. Though bumpy at times, the opening moves of Typhoon saw staggering amounts of captured enemy possessions. Seven of 15 Soviet armies were destroyed or captured. Eleven of 15 tank brigades were destroyed or captured. And 50 of 62 artillery regiments were now obliterated or within one of the two German Kessels. Added to this were 332,000 dead Soviet troops, with another 668,000 as POWs. However, such was the size of the area and the Germans' encirclements that some 85,000 POWs would escape from Vyazma and another 23,000 from Bryansk. Added to this would be about 100,000 more men from Group Ermakov who would escape. Still, with such results for the Germans, von Bock would order operations to continue on October 7th, and given how much the Russians had suffered, it made sense that the cities of Rezhev and Kalinin, north of the road to Moscow, would also fall, and to the south, Guderian would be given more men and told to continue, but only after the two latest Kessels were destroyed. That would take time, and about two-thirds of Army Group Center's forces But everything was going the invaders' way. There was now a 300-mile-wide hole in Moscow's defenses. But between the panzers needing maintenance, their lack of fuel, and the needed reduction of those two new encirclements, von Bock and his subcommanders had to wait for the next phase to begin. But no matter what happened next, General Winter would not wait. Greetings, everyone, from Central Virginia. Yeah, I should probably come up with something new. Anyway, so I just wanted to thank the latest members and thank those who have donated recently near the end of the year. Um, You lovely people get very generous, and it is greatly appreciated. So here we go. As far as members, let's see here. Uh, Miles Cardinal from... Vallejo, California, and he donated. So, Miles, thank you very much. I greatly appreciate it. Um, Peter is at Vinch from Burt, Virginia. So, a neighbor. Hello, Peter. Um, Andrew McEachern from Bloomfield, New Brunswick, Canada, I believe. So, thank you very much, Andrew. As far as those who have donated, it's a little long, but again, thank you very much. Richard Eaves, I believe is how you pronounce it. Cheryl Sewell, um, thank you very much. Jim Cregan, Mitchell Goldman, Orfer Ramirez, uh, Kevin Merrick, 
Christy Grell, Scott Lemon Lemons from Belgium. He just started this year, obviously early. Uh, excuse me, he started early in 2023, and he's all caught up. Scott, that's what I call dedication. Good on you. Ignore the job. Ignore the family. Whatever. Focus on me. That's that's how it should be. Anyway, um, Jeffrey Meredith, um, Dale Fowler. Thank you very much, Dale. Uh, Ken Johnston. Good name. That's a strong name. Hi, I'm Ken Johnston. Anyway, I'm tired right now, so don't read too much into this. And finally, Scott Wilson. So thank you for those who... And someone bought a mug. One of those names bought a mug and I'm really sorry you you should have it because I was able to send it out the next day. So whoever bought the Churchill mug, thank you very much. So this is the first episode of 2024. I'm I'm purposefully not thinking about anything. I'm just going to keep my head down, keep uh, putting out episodes and and let the chips fall where they may. No jokes about, you know, it's going to take you twice as long to cover the war as the war actually took the fight, fight. So we're going to skip over that. Anyway, so I hope you all have a wonderful 2024. Let's see here. Words of wisdom. Um, hard work creates good luck. Um, doing the right thing is never the wrong thing. Ted Lasso. Uh, and basically, the truth will set you free after it beats the shit out of you. Again, Ted Lasso. Take care, everyone, and we will see you soon with the next um, episode of Army Group Center getting very close to Moscow. Take care, everyone. Hey there. Did you know Kroger always gives you savings and rewards on top of our lower than low prices? And when you download the Kroger app, you'll enjoy over $500 in savings every week with digital coupons. And don't forget fuel points to help you save up to $1 per gallon at the pump. Want to save even more? With a Boost membership, you'll get double fuel points and free delivery. So shop and save big at Kroger today. Kroger, fresh for everyone. Savings may vary by state. Restrictions apply. See site for details. At Granger, we're for the ones who specialize in saving the day and for the ones who've mastered the art of keeping business moving. We offer industrial-grade supplies for every industry with same-day pickup and next-day delivery on most orders, all backed by real people ready to help. So you can get the right answers and products right when you need them. Call. Click Granger.com or just stop by. Granger for the ones who get it done.